whenever the road gets tough, people are going to quit. It's about time because we're going there. Welcome back to another episode of We're Going There. Ooh, get ready because today we have one of my favorite people on the podcast. He's been on the show before and to hear him is to love him. To know him is to love him more. Today we get to talk about discovering our voice, embracing the challenge and conquering our fear with none other than thought leader, pastor, writer, podcaster, New York Times bestselling author, Craig Groeschel. I love Pastor Craig. He's always so wise. And we are going to talk about starting something new, uh, the importance of conviction, surrounding yourself with the right people and having faith when you feel like you need to start something new. Whether that is a new relationship or a new business, we want to discuss the challenges and surprises of starting a business or ministry or relationship and offer practical advice for leaders in the early stages of a startup. In addition to this, I just want to encourage listeners to embrace their unique voice and take the courage of starting something new, even if you don't feel completely ready. This is near and dear to my heart, but the topic of resilience and not giving up in the face of failure, oh yeah, I wrote a book on it. It's called Grit Don't Quit, but you want to know something? So much of my grit has been fostered by the man that we get to have a conversation with today. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I enjoy Pastor Craig. To know him is to love him. To hear him is to love him more. Enjoy, friends. Now, our guest for today is a world-class leader, a fantastic communicator, and uh, you started many different organizations. Yes. Bianca Juarez Althoff, founding pastor of the Father's House in Orange County, and you also started uh, In His Love several years ago. Uh, in the Name of Love. In the yep. Name of Love, a prison initiative. Yep. You also have a podcast called Let's Go There. We're going there. We're going there, yep. where you definitely <laughs> go there, and you got a fantastic book as well, uh, How to Have Your Life Not Suck, which is really kind of a good goal. <laughs> I want to keep it simple. I want the title to explain everything. <laughs> That, that's probably a good, good, good goal in life. It's great to have you on with Thank us, you. and uh, I've admired your leadership uh, for so many years. And I, I love the fact that you not only lead something, but you started a couple of organizations. Yes. And I want to talk to you a little bit about about that. You started your most recent one a little bit later in life. Yes. And I imagine there's some people that are wondering when is the right time to start. What is it that cued you and this was a great time to start what you lead? So let me first say that I love this podcast. Thank I'm you. an avid listener to this podcast. Excellent. I can markedly look back at where I was at certain seasons or places or even countries where I'd be running and listening to this podcast. So I am an avid podcast listener of yours and now I get to be on the show. So thank you for having me. I, I'm obsessed with the show. So I think the beginning stages of starting anything always fill with a, a discontent. Like there's something mm. that is missing or something's wrong. Or if I could dare to say this, I think I might be able to do this better. Mm -hmm. That kind of quiet discontent within, within turns into something that fosters a sense of ideas. Mm -hmm. What can I do? How can I make this, how can I go further, faster, and farther mm -hmm. um, with, with this thing that I'm bringing to the market? So I, for me, it's always started with this sense of discontent. Mm -hmm and trying to provide something, a felt need for somebody in my world. I like that. I can imagine there are a lot of people listening right now that want to start something, maybe mm -hmm. a, a YouTube channel or mm -hmm. maybe a nonprofit or maybe a business. And I, I think there would be some discontent. And I also like the fact that you recognize, and it's not even prideful to say, we can do it better than what anybody <laughs> else is doing around. So I, I, I like that insight. What if you just have an idea, but you don't know if you're the right person to, to carry out the idea? How, how would a leader know that maybe I am the right person, this mm -hmm. is the right idea, this is the right time. So let's back this up to about 2015. 2015, I realized I was, I I, I labeled this a quarter life crisis. I was 25 years old. I was a Twixer, meaning I moved back in with my parents. I had finished grad school and I just was lost. I didn't know what to do. And going through that season and really finding what resources were out there, what tools were out there and stumbled my way into my thirties to kind of figure out who am I? What mm -hmm. am I about? So I realized that there's this gap, this vacuum of resources that were simple. I didn't want to come out with an almanac of how to survive your 20s. But I'm like, wait, I think there are some resources that I can provide for those that experienced a quarter-life crisis or those feeling like they had a failure to launch in their 20s and now they're in their 30s trying to figure out life. So for me, it was, okay, I have these resources that I know I can create. Let me just put my 
toe in the water. Let mm-hmm. me see if this resonates with people. So instead of, hey, let me start an NGO, I started seeding content out through social media. So I really would create kind of, if I could say bootleg and bougetto, that's uh, bougie and ghetto, all at the same time, these bougetto resources to see, hey, are people biting? So I, I think I'm a little bit more cautious and I love research. I love data. I love marketing. So for me, I wanted to be strategic. If I'm going to invest time, energy, and effort into creating these resources, let me make sure that there's this need. So I just started seeding the water and I'm like, okay, if people, if this is a need, people will respond. Slowly but surely, we started getting people who would send us their email, which this is super important in marketing and data acquisition. They would let us know stations and seasons of their life. They would take quizzes. And so from then I realized, okay, there's this groundswell of predominantly women, predominantly millennials that wanted these resources. And so for me, I was just like, this is, this is where I feel I could add value. This is where I feel like I could speak in to the next generation's life. And I've always been passionate about the next generation. I just want to create tools and be a leader that I felt like I never had that mentor. Mm -hmm. So when I, you know, the book title is how to have your life not suck. It was, it is created for millennials who really feeling like I feel a little lost. And I don't want to come in as like the guru up in the sky, but more alongside as a guide. Mm -hmm. Let's go on this adventure together. Let me tell you what I've learned. And there was a need. Yeah, there there was. And and I want to go deeper because that kind of raises some questions. Why in the world did you have the confidence? How did you know you could do it? I I imagine there's a lot of leaders right now that maybe, um, hopefully a lot of younger ones too, Mm -hmm. that see a need, find a discontent, think they could do something better. But there probably would would have been a lot of internal reasons or voices telling you why you're not the right person. Right. And yet for some reason you overcame that and attempted something (laughs) that others might say, maybe you're too young or whatever. What was what was the internal um whatever it is? The gumption, the, the chutzpah, gumption, the what, ganas, yes, yeah, the like, cojones. Yeah, 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 give me yeah, give me like 18 <laughs> names and I couldn't come up with one. But what what was that in you? How'd you find it? You know, I'm gonna be really honest. It has to it, I think I can whittle it back to being 10 years old. I am from Los Angeles, and to be specific, East Los Angeles, aka the ghetto. So when we talk about these obstacles, when we talk about what made you, what gave you, what allowed you, what empowered you, I think it started at that young age. I'm a first-generation American. I uh, couldn't read, write, or spell at the age of 12. Not because I didn't have the resources. I just really struggled academically. I was morbidly obese. I weighed more than my father. And I think statisticians would have put me in a category highest prone to failure. Uh, repeating the generational cycles of everyone living in the concrete jungle and really perpetuating the plight of many women of color. And I just, from a very young age, I, I am, I'm a woman of faith, so I have a faith background. So I will say this cautiously, but I just had a conversation with myself and with God. And I just said, if you give me words, I will give you my voice. And there has been, and there will be many people who will say, you can't you shouldn't, you wouldn't, you're not allowed. And to me, this plight of as a 10 year old of saying, I can and I will, and I'll wave at you in my rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. That has never left me since a scrappy kid from the ghetto. I, it took a lot to overcome. And I think that that, that struggle as a as an adolescent, that struggle as a teen, that struggle as in my 20s, really gave me the gumption, the unction, if it can say the cajones, to say, no, 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 no. I'm going to put my foot out there. I'm going to take this step. And listen, if it's not for me, the doors are not going to open. But if it is for me, there is no man on earth that can stop me. Yeah. Well, that, that's a pretty dramatic story to have been 12 years old and not able to read or mm-hmm. write. And mm-hmm. a lot of pretty strong reasons of why you probably shouldn't succeed. Right. And I think that probably everybody, while their excuses or limitations or challenges may or may not be as dramatic, I think we all have our resume of why we aren't ready or we aren't good enough. What would you say to someone else out there who's kind of looking over the edge right now saying, I'd I'd like to start something, but I'm not sure I'm whatever, smart enough, old enough, educated enough. What advice would you give to them if they don't have that same gumption that you had? You know, as someone who was illiterate for a number of years, I realized the power of your story. And if you aren't careful if you don't write your story, someone else will. And so it doesn't matter. I mean, someone listening in the Midwest who is highly educated and lives in an affluent area will not resonate with my story, but they'll resonate with maybe feeling underqualified. Maybe they'll feel under-resourced. Maybe they'll feel overlooked. If we allow other people to determine our destiny, to determine our future, 
then we've handed over the pen of our story and the pen of our life to them. And to me, I'm like, steal it back. Your story can only be written by you. So if you have, it doesn't matter our background. So clearly there's so many people listening to this podcast that will not resonate with my story, but they're, the hurdles in life are meant to be scaled and then told because they're inspiration for other people. Friends, I'm interrupting this podcast episode and I don't want to gross you out, but do you know that water has so many toxins? Tap water can even lead to impurities in our body and no one has wrecked my life about this more than my little sister, Alexandria, who uses filtered water for her ice cubes, her pets, and definitely for my nephew. I came across AquaTrue. AquaTrue purifiers use a four-stage reverse osmosis purification system. And the easy part about it is that there's no installation or plumbing. And this filter removes 15 times more contaminants than any ordinary pitcher filters and are specifically designed to combat chemicals like PFAS in your water supply. I know those letters might not mean anything to you, but this filtration system is different. You don't have to change filters every two to three months. AquaTrue filters last from six months to two years. Just one set of filters from their classic purifier makes the equivalent of 4,000 bottles of water. So in addition to saving plastic and saving our environment, we are saving our Cells from harmful contaminants. AquaTrue comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and even makes a great gift. Today, my listeners receive 20% off of AquaTrue Purifier. Just go to AquaTrue.com. That's A-Q-U-A-T-R-U.com and enter code W-G-T at checkout. Well, your story inspires me and I've got a ton of respect for you as a leader. In fact, um, I was honored to help invite you to be a part of the Global Leadership Summit. Brother, you open that this, door and I am running through, okay? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to run through and leave smoke behind as you do. And uh, so we're excited to hear from you. And I think about your story and it, in the world we live in today right now, it is there are more starting opportunities right. than there were ever before 10 years ago. And so that that's uh, good. And anytime you start anything and you started a lot, you're kind mm-hmm. of a marketing expert. You started um, a couple of nonprofits mm-hmm. and you um, speak and write all over the nation and, and the world. There are probably some basics on no matter what you start. If it's a for-profit business, if it's a nonprofit, if it's a online social media ministry, a platform, whatever, what would you say come to mind as the top priorities of what how a leader wants to think and what they want to do in the early stages of a start? You know, I, I love three. I love the number three. So I'm just going to whittle this down to like the three most important things that I've walked away with and learned over the last 10 years of starting things. And I would say the first one is you have got to have a conviction that this is what you are meant to do. And I use that word loosely because meant to do feels the ominous. It feels really big. But you just have that that, that discontent and that you feel like you have the solution to somebody's problem. And uh, so that conviction, because that conviction is going to carry you through when you are tired. That conviction is going to carry you through when you don't have the finances or the resource. That conviction is going to carry you through to work hours because you can't hire that other staff member. That conviction is the thing that gets you up in the morning and it's the thing that keeps you up at night. That conviction that I have the answer, I have a solution, I have a plan, I have a resource, I have a business, I have a dream that's going to help somebody live better. That conviction is going to be the thing that's going to give you the gasoline to carry and to move forward. I think the second thing is know your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So I am a dreamer. I am a visionary. I'm a motivator. If you like the movie Mean Girls, I feel like I can say I'm a pusher Mm -hmm. and I'm a good pusher. Where I lack is structure. And, um, you know, I could see where we're going. I just don't know how we're going to get there. And so surround yourself with people who kind of make up for areas that you lack or maybe areas of of, uh, maybe a deficit. Mm -hmm. And then the third is this is where, whether you have a faith background or not, I think that that uh, it coincides with conviction, but it's that inner faith. It's it's the sense of hope. Mm-hmm. I am going to outwork what I feel called to, whether it's starting a business, whether it's being an entrepreneur, whether it's launching an online platform. I am convinced that this is going to work. If failure is not an option, failure will never be. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe this is the scrappy kid in me, but I'm like, we will see this out till the very end. And I think with those three values, you know, it, it's that conviction. It's that sense of surrounding yourself where you lack and a sense of hope, yep. faith, these words that might feel uh, different to those without a faith background. I think that we can understand them in the, in the natural of like, wait, I have this, this confidence. Yeah. 
This is gonna work. What I love about your answers, Bianca, is is mm-hmm. and and you're really bringing a lot of heart to this. And you know, different leaders are going to have different strengths. And so, if I ask about startup, a lot of people are going to say you got to have your values and you, you know, <laughs> got to have it all printed out. You got to have this strategy, and you you actually really do. But without what you're talking about, whenever the road gets tough, people are going to quit. Uh And so you do need that. And so just kind of recapping what you said, the conviction matters. The third thing you said is, you know, the the faith, the ultimate Mm -hmm. belief and the, and the willingness to outwork anyone. The the second thing you said is, is absolutely and completely important is having the right people around Mm -hmm. you. When you're looking for the right leaders early in a startup, what's interesting is you may not have the money to pay them. Mm-hmm. It, they may not want to come on and say, you're a startup, I believe in you. A lot of people want to go for, you know, let's go work for somewhere that's more established and mm-hmm. we know it's going to be here for five years from now. Twofold question is, what are you looking for in the people and how do you attract them to something that's not yet built? So uh, I love leading with vision. And because I'm a visionary, this is a little bit easier and I am a lover of words. So I can paint a picture. And I love to say, I pay people an opportunity. I may not be able to pay people with like large uh, financial donations or acquiring people through large paychecks, but I love to pay people an opportunity. But to answer that question specifically, one of the things that are, are really passionate about is in casting vision and looking for people that we want to attract. It's, uh, I think it was Abraham Lincoln. When he built his team, he brought in people that were completely the antithesis of Mm -hmm. him. And I never want to be like an echo chamber of thought or think like, hey, my way is the only way. So I'm looking for people who think differently than me, um, that are not afraid to push back. I know that you're not a fan of Enneagram, but I am. And uh, my wing is a challenger. So I'm a seven. I love a good party. My wing is an eight. I'm a challenger. So I don't mind. A, I don't mind a challenge. I want people to push me to think differently. I want people to stretch me. I want people, I need, in building a team, I want someone that's going to be like absolutely with you, ride or die. We could do this. Let's take the hill. And then I need that skeptic that's going to balance this out. Well, let's talk about the practical. You know, <laughs> let's talk about how much this is going to cost us. Let's talk about the timeline. So I think when we build a team, when I build a team, I want to make sure that it's super diverse, that it's not just the same type of person wanting the same type of outcomes. I want it to be robust and look different and I'm okay with pushing back. Yeah, and I think that's great because a lot of people would think the opposite too. They they want to get people that think mm-hmm. just like them. Mm-hmm. And that's a challenge because then if, you, if you're not around people that will push back occasionally, then you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. I imagine that when you started your prison initiative, you recognized pretty quickly that without systems, things are going to fall apart. Right. Yeah. At what point did you recognize we need to start putting some systems in place? And could you give me some real kind of practical advice to someone who's starting something, where do we start in even learning to think and organize systematically? Absolutely. So when we started, I I feel like I kind of like fell into uh, the prison initiative. I I, I knew that there were those that were incarcerated that needed resources for success. Why is our attrition rate so high? When people are getting let out of prison, the recidivism is so high because there's no pathway for people to kind of get well again. And so started, had a women's conference on a whim. I, I just sensed that I was supposed to go into prisons, didn't know how. And as luck would have it, I received an email in my inbox from a warden that happened to hear me at a conference in Texas and said, hey, if you're ever in Texas, if you're ever in Lubbock, Texas, we'd love to have you. And I said, I'm going to Lubbock in three weeks. Let's make this happen. Well, I'm the visionary. I'm the dreamer. I'm like, hey, we just show up. It'll be fine. You know, it'll, it'll fix itself. And I had a staff member that really said, okay, well, we need to have a timeline. We need to have a structure. What's the flow? When I had those boundaries, then I'm like, okay, this is what I see. This is the timeline. Let's make this happen. So when, to use that as a case study, we're we're going in with convicted felons and murderers. If we don't have a game plan, this can go south, Mm -hmm. you know? And so the warden really trusted us and allowed us to have full run of not just, it ended up being, the women were so excited that we had to have two conferences that day. And we realized really quick, this is our system. This is our flow. This is our structure. Here's the outcome. What is this going to cost us? What do we need to do to get there? And um, I know this feels very basic, but when those systems and structures are in place, then the water can flow through the channel. And that's Mm -hmm. exactly what we want to happen. So we knew immediately, uh, I'm the visionary, but someone had to put things in order and put things on the timeline. And uh, I think from the very beginning, we knew that we needed to start with that. Yeah. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the people that do have the courage to start something do lean more toward the visionary side. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is they can sell like you can sell they can cast vision, they can attract people. The downside is if they don't surround themselves with the right types of people, 
then right. then you don't have the structure to sustain it. And that's why there's a lot of like, hey, we start and we die within two years. And that, that can be um, a real problem. As we're talking, I'm just thinking about the person who might be listening and saying, well, that's great because you had someone alongside of you. What about those of us that are starting and don't? I just want to speak to them because I didn't always have these people on the team, anyone, anyone from our staff at the father's house. We, so in those cases, I go back to conviction. If you know that you know that you know you're supposed to start this business, launch this podcast, start a blog, no one's going to create structure and no one's going to make your dream happen except you. Mm-hmm. So how convicted are you to do this? I fully admit structure and numbers are not my strength, but it will become my strength until someone else can come and take it to the place it should be. So I think sometimes we abdicate our responsibility to start something because, oh, we don't have a team or we don't have an assistant. We don't have this. I, I'm the visionary, but I don't have someone to outwork this. Baby boo, you are your own engine. Mm-hmm. All right. You are your rudder. You are your engine. You are the sail. You are everything. So I just want to kind of remove any excuses that maybe people might have think, well, I don't have that, become that. Mm-hmm. And then as it grows, the right people will latch onto the vision. And if it's meant to be, it will carry on. So you probably had some assumptions going into starting something that mm-hmm. were not exactly right. What surprised you um, or something you learned along the way that you didn't oh, expect? The list is long, but let me start with this one. The fact that I'm on a leadership podcast and speaking at GLS is so humbling because I wouldn't, I'm wouldn't. i not the quintessential leader. You know, I look at, quite honestly, I look at you. I look at some of these other people. And this so is- So let, let me just push you for fun and say, what is the quiz, quintessential leader if you're not? Oh, well, there wait, you go. Wait, wait, wait. Right? Oh, no, wait, no, no, this is I'm, important. I'm a challenger. No, this I is important. You. I know you are. It, it, I know you are. You know, I look at, I look at, you know what but, it is? I look at everything I'm not. I look I'm at not going to surrender. Okay, I'm not going to surrender here. Great. Because you there, have big there biceps, are so, but I am so, a Latina with Will. There are so many people out there. This may be the most heated <laughs> argument I've ever had, and we're laughing. There are so many people out there that are going to say that they're not that. And right. I'm going to look on at you and say, you're a world class leader. So if you are the normal traditional leader, then you may not be world-class. Let's not Mm. not try to be what somebody else is. Mm. And that's why you're on this today is because you showed up with you. And I don't want anybody out there to give me that excuse, which Mm. is I'm not what somebody else is. You be who you are. So that's that's the only reason I'm pushing back. Because we'd rather follow people who are Always real real than always. right. You do listen. (laughs) (laughs) You know, but the beautiful thing about this, not but, and, and I will say, you are absolutely right. What I've come to realize is that I am a leader. Yes. But I feel like I have been the reluctant leader. Mm-hmm. And the beautiful thing that I'm learning and, now. And many of the best ones are. Right? Yes. That's what I'm realizing. Yes. I think I actually think I'm going to talk about this at GLS. Anyone, so who's, feet, anyone who's like really confident they have it all together probably has a lot to also learn. also annoying. Yes. Like, let's get real. <laughs> yes. So for everybody out there right now who feels reluctant yeah. or feels like you're not the quintessential leader, maybe you're the right one for the job. Ooh, yes. Mm. Yes. And this is why, this is my favorite podcast. So you give wind you're in my sails. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a big believer in what you do. Thank and you. I'd love to, before we wrap up too, um, again, your book is really good and I'll, I'll hold it up for the camera <laughs> so people can see. Um, how to have your life not suck, becoming today who you want to be tomorrow. And I just want to say thank you for um, bringing the title of your podcast is- We're going there. We're going there. You just do that. You just, you, just, you. you just go there and you say things that sometimes other people wouldn't say. And you're also able to do things a lot of other leaders wouldn't do. And so I hope that there's someone out there listening. And wouldn't it be amazing if two years from now, we got an email or we we're out somewhere and we met someone who said, I listened to that podcast and because of it, I started something. I love that. So to whoever's on the edge, what I don't want you to do because you are a salesperson, I don't want you to talk someone to starting the wrong thing at the wrong time. Right. Because that happens all the time. But I want you just to think about someone listening right now that probably does have an idea that's worthy of doing. And even though they don't feel completely ready, then they're not because they don't know everything that they need to know. And that's, that's part of it. Talk to that person and give them the courage to do what um, they may not quite have the courage to do. Mm. Your voice is unique and there's only one you. And I sounds like an after school special or some cliche meme that we see on Instagram. But the truth of the matter is, is that if you have been uniquely fashioned with your voice and your story, your skill, your gumption, why let someone else take what you were supposed to do and make what you were supposed to make. I I just, I can't help but feel if we are gifted, which I believe we are, if we are crafted, which I believe we are, for a specific purpose, which I believe we are, 
I never want someone to miss out on the fullness of what they could have been or what their business could have been, what their book or their podcast could have been. I would rather those listening take that that shot, take that step, have the the conviction to do what they feel like they've been called to do than miss out and watch a ship sail with someone else doing what they was birthed in them months, years, or decades before. I just can't help but speak to those listening and saying, you never know unless you try. No. And you have to do it. And you have to fail repeatedly because what we haven't addressed is the topic of like, you will fail. You will fail gloriously. Mm-hmm. But the victor is the one who keeps back up and keeps going. And I think yeah. that that's the one thing that I have. I have that sense of conviction. I am resilient. And to the victor goes the spoils. Yeah. Never give up. Well, Amy, I love you and appreciate Likewise. you.